Okay, all good. So I'm going to very briefly introduce Mary and then I'll give her the floor to give her talk and show some images. Um, and then we can do questions at the end. So I'm just gonna read a quick intro to Mary. I think probably all of you know her at least a little bit, but just so we all have the same background, I'm gonna read just a little intro to Mary. So Mary is a visual artist and art teacher, a native Pennsylvanian. She graduated from Grove City College in 2016, where she majored in English and philosophy and was very involved with art and music. Mary studied for an MA in philosophy in Belgium and continues to pursue philosophy of art and aesthetics in addition to her studio practice. In 2019, she studied painting at the master's level with the Leo Marschut School Community in Aix-en-Provence, France. Her artwork has been exhibited in France and the United States, including an, a solo exhibition of 75 works at her undergraduate alma mater, and many works are in private collections throughout the United States, Canada, France, Belgium, and the United Kingdom. Following her studies, Mary spent several years teaching art for the classical charter school network Valor Education based in Austin, Texas. During her years at Valor, Mary helped shape and develop the K through 10 curriculum and educational practices of the art department, inspired deeply by the principles and practices she had gleaned from her time at the Leo Marshute School. Mary currently lives in Rhode Island with her husband, Rob Duffy, and young children, Evelyn, Jack, and Irina, who was born in January, 2024. So with that, I will hand things over to Mary. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for uh, being here. I'm really honored and excited to um, uh, talk to you about my art. Um, so I'm going to bring up some images in just a minute, um, but kind of for the, like a, a, a structure of the talk, um, I'm gonna be, just mention a little bit of biography kind of things um, and then go into my approach and process. So painting and kind of spend most of the time there looking at works um, together. And then a little bit about how Marshutes has continued to um, inspire me as a teacher too, um, and touch on that a little bit. Um, so um, yeah, just to begin, um, I always loved making art. Um, when I was in college, I began taking some art history classes for the first time. And that was the first time I really spent a lot of time looking at um, great works of art. And I remember leaving class sometimes just feeling like I have to go paint, just feeling so inspired by what I, I'd been looking at. Um, and I just kind of painted independently um, in college. And I was looking towards programs for, um, you know, after, after that. And I felt like as I looked at these great works of art from art history, um, you can see this kind of um, life and, and beauty, vitality to these works, despite many different styles um, and, um, and different eras. And um, I wanted to find, you know, in my work to um, have that same kind of life and energy. And I, as I was looking at different art schools, I felt kind of discouraged. Either schools seem to intentionally not want to have anything to do with the history of art. Um, and it was kind of a rejection of that. And in place of that, kind of simply what you wanted, what you wanted to express. Um, but with, it seemed like um, without any kind of response to, to nature or what's seen or um, seeking to be, um, yeah, responding to or part of what's come before. So um, I, I also felt though, as I looked at some more traditional art schools um, that even though it seemed like many of the artists were very skilled, um, they didn't have the same kind of life and energy that I was seeing in these masterworks from throughout art history. Um, and I felt like that was a little discouraging too, because it seemed like these schools are trying to be traditional and they say that they're in a tradition, but I felt like, um, yeah, that I, I wasn't seeing that kind of um, um, sort of being in the tradition, but also in the present moment as well. 
So um, anyway, it was through a, a Google search that I first heard about the Leo Marshard School. And um, I yeah began studying in, um, so it was 20, 2017 was my, my first time there. Um, I, I think I'm gonna go ahead and, and pull up some artworks now. Um, and we can sort of, I'll, yeah, dive into what my process became as I studied at the school. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, when I first um, yeah came to the school, I it was um, I was kind of for the first time really immersing myself in um, painting directly from life and nature, and I think that's become one of the most important um, aspects of of my approach to art. Um, a seeking a direct encounter with the thing itself. So um, when I first started at the school though, I found this way of painting kind of disorienting um, because you go out into the landscape and there's so much movement um, in the changes of the weather and the trees and um, the colors. It was, um, I remember feeling like as I'm painting, um, you know, what, just felt um, like, I, like I was kind of losing, losing control or something like that. Um, and uh, it was really hard to feel like um, I, I couldn't, yeah, have sort of complete, um, yeah, control of everything. And yet I think that was learning to kind of let go and accept that challenge of looking at life um, helps me even more um, kind of understand how to um, capture something, um, express something of that vitality and life of, of nature, um, that movement that we see. Um, I think that has become, um, yeah, so, so, sorry. So that became a really important part of my practice um, always sort of seeking to directly encounter the thing itself. Um, with this painting, um, just as, as a place to start, um, portraits are something that I've, I, I, a type of painting I really love to do. Um, and in portraits like this one, um, I'm seeking to, to show something of the, the character of the, of the person that I'm seeing. Um, uh, something of their of who they of who they are as a person, um, not not simply um, not merely a representation of them, but to try if I can to um, capture something of that that life that they have. Um, I um, also found during my time, um, like with this. Um, still life that different techniques or, or ways of approaching a work um, would be determined by the thing that I was looking at. So um, rather than going into a work using um, like always beginning the same way, um, the same, you know, outline or starting at the same place on the canvas or something, or even how quickly I laid down my strokes. Um, I seek to, in my work, um, let the, the particular object kind of interpret for me how, um, uh, how I ought to paint it. So with this work, um, this was one that I spent a, a long time on um, and and worked at it very slowly. Um, with this one, um, sort of taking just stroke by stroke, working around around the canvas, trying to bring bring to life that uh, teapot and those pears, um, uh, just without um, 
do I say? Um, for bringing, bringing it up all at once, I guess. Um, I, uh, yeah. Um, this was another one, um, probably one of my favorite portraits that I painted where going into it, I remember feeling like I, I knew I was going to fill the canvas um, with paint. Um, and I had, I had my colors all set out and sort of had the, a, a sense of what I thought I was going to do. Um, but I remember with this work, it was a moment of really letting my, my eyes and my hand um, and that relationship come together to make this work um, rather than getting, letting my, my thoughts kind of get in the way. Um, I, because there was something that I had, I had thought I wanted to do that, um, <clears throat> that I would do with this work. And as the painting was emerging, <clears throat> I felt like to let it speak, it had to be just what it was. Um, and so this was, this is a painting that obviously has a lot of, um, the canvas showing, but I think that that is part of what brings it its life um, and speaks just as much as um, the strokes themselves. Um, <clears throat> there's the work on the canvas um, in the studio. Um, with this still life, this was also another moment of kind of discovery for me I had begun this work, and then um, this was at the in the in the studio, and um, came to a point where I was just sort of taking a break. And I remember Alan coming over, and I said, "Oh, I'm not done with this yet. I'm just I'm just taking a break." And he said, um, "Well, where would you put the next stroke?" And then. <laughs> we spent quite a while sort of looking at, well, maybe maybe here or maybe here. And I began to realize that um, this painting, if I were to lay down another stroke, as Alan always says, there, it, sometimes that is going to necessitate a thousand more. Um, and I had to learn that there was already um, enough here to show something of, um, to show just what was um, essential to conveying the, um, um, to communicating the, what, I, what, what I'd seen, what, what was there um, and expressing its, its being in this, in this painting. Um, and I think that um, sort of seeking what's essential has become, uh, uh, key to, to my artwork as well. Um, I feel like we, um, yeah, getting back to what's sort of most, um, most important to expressing what's there. I think that's sort of, that's why my, um, my works sometimes are um, uh, just, yeah, if, a few strokes sometimes, but trying to express the um, something something true, um, and getting at at only what's what's essential. Um, this, uh, I think I'm going to skip this for now. Maybe I'll come back. Um, just wanted to share a few more examples of portraits here too, um, and. I'll see if I have any other particular things to say about them, but we can come back if you have any questions on um, particular ones. Um, I did, I've done quite a lot of uh, musician portraits and I love um, working with the model who's, who's in the midst of creating that music. And so in some of the musician portraits that, I, that I've done, um, seeking to, con to convey something of that, of that feeling of the music that you, that you sense there. Um, in their in their portraits.
I wanted to talk a little bit about this one. Um, this portrait was for me kind of a, a culmination um, of my uh, of my work in a way. I um, it was it's one of the largest paintings I've done. It's about three feet by four feet, um, and um, I um, began by doing a, a pencil sketch. It was of my friend Sophie, um, fellow student who had been my model many other times. So I, I um, she was kind of a, a motif for me. And uh, so I, I asked her to sit for this portrait and um, began with a pencil sketch and then came into the painting. Um, and this is one where I, I felt in that process of painting like, um, Well, yes, in the in the in the process, coming through all these different sections, seeking to bring up the whole work, um, kind of at once together, um, meaning that, um, yeah, trying to see where my eye and hand lead, rather than um, thinking I need to start with one thing or another. I, like to finish the face first or something, but kind of to bring it all together so that this figure really feels as though they're, they're within this atmosphere in this place. Um, um, this is another one I wanted to share of my daughter, Evelyn. Um, I was able to paint this one from life when she was taking a nap on a day that we had a, a snow day in Texas, which was very um, unusual. But um, uh, I, with this one, also trying to sort of capture the, the, the moment that I'm seeing, um, I uh, remember I would sometimes just be, because she was moving around in her sleep, I, I remember seeing her you know, put her hand up like that. And that sort of stuck in my mind. And I felt like I have to paint that and like laid down a few strokes for that. And when she happened to have her other arm on her chest, that's where that needs to be too. So even as she was moving, I felt like those were those moments that had struck me. Um, and I um, <clears throat> sort of just laid down a few strokes and then brought in the rest of the, uh, the work um, to paint her before she woke up. Um, this was one I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about. Cezanne talks, or uh, an essay about Cezanne talks about the way he sought to paint, not with a geometric perspective, but a lived perspective. Um, so as if, you know, if you're looking at one thing, then your periphery vision is sort of is a little bit out of focus. Maybe. Um, and so if you're going to paint that way, um, then how I was looking at this, I was kind of, I was looking at the lamppost, focused on that, and then letting my sort of, rather than looking at each of everything else that I was seeing around it, sort of paint from my periphery vision. Um, but um, sort of centering on this almost portrait of, of the lamppost. Um, this was in Venice, um, my second year of the program of shoots. And I remember this time in particular, um, just really trying to, to bring in the, the, the atmosphere, the weather, um, sort of to feel all of that in the work. And <clears throat> the other thing about this painting too, even though I was looking at the lamppost, I felt that in order to sort of, it, to honestly, represented and to bring it out in the wholeness of the work, I couldn't just go and put down some strokes for the lamppost. I had to, I had to wait, I had to be kind of patient. So I was working on um, the ground, some of the sky, the columns. And I remember finally feeling like, now I can like, I can lay down the stroke um, and, and put some of those down because um, that lamppost had to has to contribute to the rest of the work. I'm not 
um, even though I'm focused on that, I don't want to be seeing that simply in isolation and then there's just stuff around it or the background or something like that. Um, but all of this um, has a, um, needs to convey a, a wholeness and unity to it um, like, like I'm seeing out there in the landscape, right? That reality has, that nature has. This was the next day. So that was, um, I did a few paintings from this same spot. Uh, I think this day was a little bit rainier than the other one. And that, that affected the way I laid down my strokes as well as some of the, the colors that I used here too. Um, yeah, just some photos of that spot and the progress of the palette. Um, up in the top corner there, you can kind of see, um, maybe for those who, who don't paint as much, um, uh, yeah, just to see this is, um, you can see all the colors, the paint, tube paint sort of laid out on the edges. And then in the center, I've got um, lots of different colors that I was mixing um, to prepare for the painting. Um, so trying to, yeah, have a, have a harmony in the palette, first of all, um, spending, I'd spend maybe half an hour and 45 minutes just mixing colors, getting that prepared. And then as the painting goes along, I'd end up mixing even more, but at least this was a place to, to begin. And you can kind of see how it got a little crazy later on. Um, but, um, This was another um, uh, landscape series that I did um, in uh, Giverny, France, um, where Monet had lived, um, and two different days from the same from the same spot. And I, I remember with this one again, just feeling like I was really trying to. Um, Refine what would be most um, most essential um, in the landscape. I I wanted to show both of these together because um, in my work sometimes I do lay down strokes a little bit more slowly and um, and other times it's much more quick work um, and um, I remember Alan once describing this as kind of like a classical and a romantic impulses that can kind of be at war within an artist. And um, I thought these were two, um, yeah, kind of examples of that with this portrait and um, this landscape. Another series just of, you know, trying, painting the same thing again and again to continue to learn from it, to see how the light changes, um, um, how the colors, color harmonies interact with each other. Um, just a few other works here too. Um, and then um, the other thing that I, I really wanted to um, say a bit about in the talk as well is just how much um, uh, masterworks have affected um, my practice and, and helped me grow as an artist. Um, I chose these ones to show just as a few um, artists to highlight that have really had a, a deep effect on me. Rembrandt up in the corner um, on the left um, and his sketches as well in the center there at the top. Uh, Monet work. Um, this was one where I really looking at it in person um, with the Marshute School, discussing it together, began to learn something of how um, profound paintings can be, especially when you give them the time um, to really speak for themselves, to um, when you have, when you are willing to look and um, be open to them. I, uh, I think we sat probably an hour and a half or two hours or something in front of this work. And the more we looked at it and discussed it, just, just looking at the relationships of strokes and different colors, um, um, our experience of the work deepened. Um, and I remember by the end, um, 
for me, um, the, a piece of music came to mind from a, a, a requiem. <laughs> so it was kind of a, a funeral piece, but with this, that has this hope to it as well. Um, and I felt like um, that had emerged from, from looking at this work. Um, then um, some Cezanne here as well. He's been a, a great influence for me, I think, too, in um, my approach and um, how I how I use colors. And then um, Vermeer down at the bottom, um, Bruegel with the Hunters in the Snow, and um, and some uh, a Goya portrait there as well. Um, these are just a few sketches that I wanted to share as well um, of masterworks. And then I thought this would be a, a good way to just mention some of the things that I did when I was um, teaching in Texas. Um, one of the things that the school really emphasized was direct encounter with a thing itself and wonder that comes from that. Um, so sort of learning through, through wonder, through encounters. Um, so as I was teaching these students, um, I wanted them to um, see a lot of great works of art to be to um, not not only look at them, but um, to make that become part of their imagination. Um, because I think the kind of things that you the things that you look at um, that, that you take in are going to be part of what you then express. Um, that's going to, it's going to shape your imagination. So um, for these kids, um, from you know from kindergarten to high school, um, we were showing them masterworks. Um, we would at whatever age level was appropriate for them, discussing those a little bit, and then um, our projects were often based on on great works of art too. For my older students, like middle schoolers and high schoolers, we would begin every day with a daily sketch. So um, an artwork would be on the board when they came in and then they would do a little thumbnail, five, 10 minute sketch of the masterwork. Um, and sketching is such a good way to help you um, learn about works of art, to see, see them more deeply, as well as discussing them, of course, but um, uh, helping them, have that practice, I think, I hope, um, you know, it's not only making them stronger artists, but also um, shaping their visual kind of imaginations. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, so. And these are just a few student works from, these are from elementary and middle schoolers that I wanted to share too, where I thought, um, another aspect of teaching for teaching them was um, that I focused on was was um, sort of color mixing and blending and trying to paint um, the whole. So we have a couple still lives here and then um, some masterwork copies in the center there from that that yeah elementary middle school students did too. Um, so yeah, um, I think the last thing I wanted to, let me see if I can get to the right slide. Well, I'll just, yeah, leave it at this one. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention um, that I, uh, for my work, I, see my work as both, um, I hope, contemporary of this present time and moment, but also um, something that has that um, sense of the, of, of the, of the past as well. Um, T.S. Eliot has that, has a quote, um, where he's talking about poets, that a poet or artist does not have their complete meaning alone, um, but your meaning comes through um, how it um, is part of a, of a, of a much larger narrative. 
Um, and he talks about poetry or art having a kind of historical sense that there's something timeless and temporal, that there's a pastness to things of the past, but also its presence. Somehow these, these works of art that we look at uh, these are that they speak to us now as well, um, even though they're, you know, we can tell they're from a different um, period, hundreds of, hundreds of years ago or something. So with my art, um, I, uh, yeah, I'm seeking as well to be, to be, a, to be a part of that, um, to have something that is, to, to make works that are present and, and alive um, and, 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 and part of what's, what's come before. Um, so anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, happy for, for any questions and I can, uh, I can go back to any, um, I can go back to any pictures as well. Thank you so much, Mary. That was so beautiful. Big round of applause. Um, we can do questions now and for everyone on here on Zoom, um, if you have a question, you're all muted automatically. So you'll have to go ahead and unmute yourself to ask a question. And um, I can sort of help field questions. If you just want to like put your hand up like this, I can sort of call on you. Um, but Mary, I'll start with a question. Um, it's so great to see all your works together from your time in France, from Texas, from your life now. Um, I'm curious what your practice looks like now with as a busy mom of three. Um, you know, do you find time to do drawings and paintings still in your everyday life? Or how does your practice look these days? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we've been in Texas until last summer, and now we're in Rhode Island. And um, now that we're up here, I'm not teaching at this time. Um, although I am going to be teaching a like art um, like a week long art program thing this summer. Um, but I just kind of kind of catch where I can with with drawing and painting right now. I I feel like though I still see myself as an artist. And even though there's like a necessary <laughs> little bit of a break right now with three tiny children, um, it's something that I love so much and I love um, making and thinking about and writing about. So I think that will, a teaching, and I think that will continue. I did actually though, this was the last oil painting that I've done recently. I did a, um, it's a Manet copy, if you know the barmaid painting. So you can see that. But this was the one that, um, yeah, that I copied um, a few months ago. Lovely. Beautiful. Yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. Oh, great. Thank you. Any other questions for Mary? Other Mary? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> You'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, I haven't formulated the question fully in my head, um, but um, you spoke about uh, drawing and sketching and when you're teaching the students, uh, the importance of sketching, but I noticed um, and you said you do this in your practice as well, but some of your work, it looked like there was that particular still life where you and Alan had discussed, there was no other place to put a stroke. I saw a lot of charcoal with the paint. And then uh, most of your portraits, it just looked like you were using the brush with the color as a, instead of a sketch before, or do, do you, draw on paper on the side? Or are you always sketching on the, I just want to hear about your technique of using yeah. drawing and painting and how the marriage comes right. together. That's a really good question. Um, I, so this is one area where I've wanted to like, what I was saying about trying to let the, the thing itself that I'm looking at kind of speak um, and show me how I need to paint it. Sometimes I have felt like drawing straight on the canvas with a, a light sketch or, or a charcoal sketch sometimes is the way I need to start. Um, and, and some of my paintings do have that. There's some charcoal underneath. 
um, or like with that large painting of Sophie, um, I'd done a whole kind of pencil under sketching of that. Um, but other times, like the, the, I find sometimes that the problem with that is if I, if I treat the drawing that I've done there as like, now that's what I'm looking at. And I'm going to now just paint based on what I've drawn. Yeah. I don't want to end up doing that because then I'm distracting myself from actually looking at the thing and having as much of a relationship with the thing I'm looking at. So um, the times that I've sketched on there, I really try to make sure that I'm, that's part of the painting stuff. That's part of the whole work. Um, um, sometimes I will sketch something beforehand too, to just get more practice, to look at it more. And, um, and so, yeah, have a few pencil sketches on another sketch beforehand, but um, a lot of times I'll just, I'll dive into it with color as well. Thank you. Grace, do you have a question? You'll just have to go ahead and unmute. There you go. I do, Mary. Thank you for such a beautiful talk. Um, I love seeing your work. And I just want to ask you, you held up a comparison or two paintings, a portrait next to a landscape of Giverny mm -hmm. at one point. And I was curious, you talked about the difference in laying down the quick strokes and those mm -hmm. that are a little slower, more meticulously um, rendered. Yeah. And I was curious if you meant within one painting or if you meant one painting was more quickly painted or one was more slowly painted or if you meant within one painting, there's certain strokes that are more each individual stroke, if that makes yeah. sense. That's a good question. I'm just, let me pull up the paintings here. Would that be helpful too? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I uh, sometimes it could be within the same painting, but I think I was thinking more of times where I've just approached a painting um, sort of as a whole pretty quickly, or I've done it kind of slowly. So um, with the one on the right with the portrait, this was one where it was more, a little bit more feverish in laying down the strokes and trying to bring this painting up. Um, and like with those painting, those strokes up at his head and the, the green ones in the back there, I think I even remember sort of the feeling of that, like really trying to get those all brought in together to, to bring this work up. Um, with the other one, that was kind of like, you know, very carefully taking taking the brush and looking out, um, looking back at the canvas and like a small stroke in in a in a place, and then that is leading me leading my eyes towards you know, another part of the work, and so another stroke there, um, sort of drawing me through it, but much more. Um, yeah, just. Um, seems like more kind of a little bit more meditative or something um, in in how I'm laying them down. Um, but again, that's sometimes also it's not it's not like I've gone to the motif knowing that I'm going to do that, but it's kind of been what I've seen when I've got there or how it how it feels in that moment um, to try to kind of honestly express the person I'm seeing or the the landscape or or something about the still life. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Other questions for Mary? Alan, go ahead. You'll just have to unmute. Can we Alan, un you'll have to oh there you go. Hey. How you doing, Mary? Great. Good can we you. leave that? Can you put that? Uh, that one back on? Yeah. We can, we can find it really interesting too, in terms of um, the quality, the, the white surface is operating. 
I don't know if that's something that you think about, but yeah, can you put them back up, the two? Yeah, are the they up now? Like the one, on the, yeah. The one on the right, I feel like I sort of enter into the painting and I'm I'm responding more to how the strokes relate one to the other. It's really wonderful the way the the strokes are very present. And then the one on the left, I feel like I'm much more drawn to the like the major sort of white, beautiful, voluminous surfaces of the you know, where you didn't put any paint. Do you do you see what I mean? The stroke isn't as the stroke in the painting on the right, I mean, that might be related to sort of the, you were talking about the classical and the romantic. I mean, I'm just wondering if that's something that you think about in terms of how the painting sort of shows itself. The painting, for me, the painting on the right shows itself through the stroke, the different colors of the strokes and the white of the surface sort of bows to the, wonderful strokes in the painting. In the painting on the left, it feels like the strokes sort of recede and bow to the fullness of the white of the different big masses, the beautiful full masses up in the sky and down in the field. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I hadn't. I mean, is that something that, I mean, I see that in your works throughout, you know, throughout. Sometimes it's the strokes that create the emotion more than say what's not stroke. And then in others, what's not stroke seems to come fuller than than the stroke. That makes sense. I don't know if Yeah, that makes that does make sense. I think I hadn't thought of it that way um before, but I um I can really feel that with these paintings. The one on the left, especially that, yeah, what you're saying about the um each of these sort of white spaces having a different kind of um quality to it and a feel um that is bringing out the um the the life of the painting and then the other one yeah that the strokes themselves seem to be more um what what comes out at you at, at, at the viewer yeah um i yeah i hadn't thought of it that way but i think that's that's helpful thank you that pervading light in the one on the left sort of that classical sensation of sort of calm fullness is so beautiful in comparison to the other one what's beautiful in the other one is the emotion in terms of how the strokes move around it's really different you have a beautiful um feeling for portraiture especially in some, the heads and the i feel like the uh particular emotion and feeling in the uh, features and how they show themselves is really beautiful. Thank you, thank you. It's, um, portraits are, uh, I think my favorite kind of thing to do um, in painting. Um, although sometimes I almost feel like with with still lives or landscapes, there's still portraits too. <laughs> like it all kind of yeah. is a portrait. Now I'm the one. Now I'm the one muted. Jen, do you have a question? You can go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah. Um. So I was wondering, um, uh, for Mary. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing. I I really enjoyed everything you had to say, and seeing your work. Um. I I know that you are interested in many different things, though, and are gifted in many areas, though, besides art, and that you, um, you know, you have a background in um the language arts and philosophy and also um you know do choir a lot and so I was wondering how those have influenced your art which in some way it almost kind of seems like Marshutes is the perfect place to explore that since we Marshutes does integrate those things but I'm also wondering how your if your art has influenced those other areas of your life as, as well? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you, Jen. Um, hmm. 
Well, um, I think that some of the things that I've really learned from painting, um, from the process of painting, um, sort of about, for example, um, the relationship of parts to whole, um, of having both um, like f freedom and um, like a precision or accuracy um, that's not, um, you know, restricted, but that is also, that's free, kind of the, the balance of these things. Um, I feel like um, those are some things that through painting I've, I've come to see that in other things as well, like um, how, um, like with, with singing, for example, um, um, or, or being in a choir, like the same, it's the same kind of thing of that all of these um, different parts creating something that's larger than, um, that's not, that's uh, the whole being, not just the sum of its parts, um, but all of this creates a new uh, life and beauty and the way in which you're, um, like if you're, if you're a choir singer, um, you, you're listening to everyone else, you're participating with the whole group. And if you just want to sort of stand out, um, you know, to like be yourself or something, you're going to end up, um, hurting, hurting the rest of the choir. And like, it's going to be kind of, you're just, you're going to be a, dis, a distraction or something, you know, like, um, and it's kind of the same with the, but, but if you are listening to everyone else, if you are blending with everyone else, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're making something that's actually beautiful and powerful. Um, that, and, and I, I guess I kind of think of it the same way with the, with these, with the strokes, you know, like of a painting, right? That every one of these strokes, um, even though you might, I might think in my mind, like the face is the most important thing. And so then I'm really trying to like get all of these strokes just right. Like if those strokes don't meaningfully participate and contribute to everything around it, then um, I've got a head that uh, doesn't have an atmosphere to breathe in, you know, like that's, that's lifeless that, um, because all of those strokes that are making up that face, um, just like we see and experience people in reality, we're not all just in isolation, there's everything we see around people and that we are part of, um, like that uh, needs to be, needs to come out in my pain too. So, um, yeah, I think that kind of parts and whole relationship is is all over, um, and uh, but I yeah maybe maybe you're, I feel like that's more like on a philosophical side or way of thinking about things, but like maybe more I'm trying to think if there are more practical ways too. Um, I mean I I think however you're um, like whatever way, different ways you're creating, like it affects the other types of ways that you're, you're creating too. So I think um, even if it's sort of subconscious, um, uh, like I'm, I'm sure that becoming a painter has helped me become a better um, singer and uh, reader of literature. better able to listen to music, things like that. Yeah. Thanks. That's a really interesting question. Thank you, Jen. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Oh, Hannah, do you have a question? You could just have to unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello. It's so good to see you, Hi, Mary, Hannah. and see other faces. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I am this last year I've been teaching K through eight music and I I love that you were relating the choir to um, painting, being in the choir to painting. Um, and I definitely have used a lot of uh, the Marshutes philosophy in my music teaching. Um, next year, I'll be taking on uh, music and art for K through eight. And um, so it was really great to hear about your processes and, um, and processes in teaching the, your K through 10 students. Um, and I was just curious with the daily sketches that you do of the masterworks, uh, how early do you have them do that? Like what is the youngest grade or age that you'll start them painting and sketching from the masters? Well, um, for those daily sketches that started with sixth graders. Um, so like, uh, I guess that's about 11 or 12 year olds. Mm -hmm. um, and also with those starting in middle school, they would do, we would do seminar discussions every week on works of art too. Um, uh, so yeah, they can do that, but, but in the younger grades as well, all the way to kindergarten projects were based on masterworks. Um, so, so, um, at all ages we were doing that and would take not necessarily every day, but um, we would um, spend some time to like, I put a work of art on the board and we'd talk about the colors that we saw or different values that we saw, or, you know, kind of, um, we, we used a few, had a, a few key um, terms that we taught the students so that they had some working vocabulary, but then we keep building from there. You know? Because at that age, they, um, yeah, they just, you need to give them some of those tools, I think, so they know, um, uh, yeah, have, have some vocabulary to work with. Um, but yeah, it was, it was all grades. But the sketches were, were middle school and up. Okay. <laughs> Um, I missed part of that because my app just closed out completely. Um, so like the very last part, would you mind repeating that? Oh, um, just that, um, yeah, even down into elementary school too, we would um, begin class looking at a work together and kind of talk about it in terms of like, well, what colors are we seeing? What values and sort of trying to talk about it in those, in those ways, what are the concrete colors and lines and things that you're seeing? Um, not just like, how does it make you feel or something? Um, and then um, our projects as well were often based on, on um, masterworks. They were, they were usually masterwork copies. Um, or sometimes we do like, we did still, I did still lives with like third and fourth graders and um, uh, uh, yeah, variety of other things, but yeah putting those things in front of them is, is that's going to shape and inform their imaginations and help them to be able to um, express themselves better, you know, because they'll have a richer imagination. Wonderful. Thank you. Patricia, do you have a question? You'll just have to go ahead and unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, Mary, I just wonder if we can go back and look at one of your paintings one more time. Yeah, sure. Uh, and the one I'm thinking of is the first lamppost painting from Venice. Yeah. And I just wanted to dwell with that a little bit longer, um, partly because of the what you were saying about peripheral vision. Huh. Um, yeah. <clears throat> It reminded me so much of, uh, uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. I, it reminded me of um, Baudelaire's poem, Correspondence. I don't know if you know it, but it's- I know that one, I'll write it down. Yeah, Correspondences, I think in English. And it, it's uh, thinking of nature as a temple and this kind of relationship between the sound, sound, musical sounds, and and um, living structures, 
And when you first put this painting up, I just love the fact that, especially on the right hand, uh, what is to my right, uh, the lampposts left, <laughs> Those uh, cluster of columns look so much like tree trunks to me. They look like they're really alive and uh, somehow this um, city slicker uh, lamppost has been, you know, invited into a world of really um, voluminous, um, trees or something like that. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, going off in, in other directions with it, but I just wonder if you could, uh, sh share some more about, um, the experience of looking at this painting after the fact, uh, not, not the, your experience of why you were painting it or what you were trying to do with peripheral vision then, but when you return to this painting, how does it, how does it, feel to you? What what kind of experience do you have when you uh, see it again? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, for me with this painting, I, there are certain strokes, I think, that, um, that I, that I always seem to, to, that I always seem to notice again, and that really strike me and, and seem to kind of move me in the work I think mm -hmm. the lamppost is so straight <laughs> like it's so like it just cuts but then um so there's something about that but in the midst of all of this like there's sort of the um, like gentleness of the sky there's a little bit of choppiness on the water um I I'm struck too by some of the strokes on the edge of the lamp of the column that's closest to the lamppost, um, those like very delicate edges to it, right? There's no there's no strong like outline edge to it um, as a whole, but there are certain places where there are faint there are some lines, and so mm -hmm. I think those kind of strike me too. I wonder if it's maybe because of the relationship of those to the lamppost. Um, but also just, I can, I feel the different volumes of the columns compared to the other things. Like a lot of these colors are, are pretty similar and some of it's, um, in some, in some way, or can feel that way at first. But when I'm really looking at it, it's like, no, these things really stand out as they're they're different things um, and have that roundness to them. And the 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 column that's closest to me too, um, on the on the far left there, that one I feel like sort of comes out at you a little bit. But that's the way it, I feel like that's true to the experience of being close to something that's sort of in your periphery vision, um, and um, that it's sort of like is is sort of coming coming close to and I feel that kind of roundness in it as well it's um mm -hmm. convex or something of coming towards me I guess that's kind of some of my thoughts on it thank you beautiful Alan did you have a question oh I was just gonna remark on the rose sort of violet brownish strokes in the middle of the second tree, just sort of right in the middle of the painting are extraordinary in terms of how everything turns around. That mm -hmm. kind of rose, violet mm -hmm. square, in the mm -hmm. middle of the painting. It's nowhere else in the painting. It's really sort of settles your eye right there. It's really beautiful. That's all. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Allison, do you have a question? No. <laughs> Allison, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Did that work? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mary, this is, hi, Mary. This has been so delightful. Thank you for doing this. What a treat to see your work and hear about your process. I was 
very struck by your story of learning to paint a landscape. And you talked about sitting in this place and noticing the movement and feeling the changes in weather and um, trying to decide, okay, how do I paint this now? Or where do I start? It felt a little like things are out of control. Um, and I'm asking this question because as you were talking, it, I, I, I had the beginning of this, um, this feeling that there's some application there for motherhood. <laughs> I know you're a, a mother of young children and I am also. And um, I, wonder, I wonder how your role as an artist has been shaped by motherhood or vice versa also, how your, how your vision of motherhood is shaped by your background in art. Um, and specifically, I'm, I'm really curious to know in that moment, how did you begin when you're overwhelmed by this landscape before you and everything going on, changes in the environment, how do you start um, just, you know, very practically, what did you, what did you decide? What place did you have to arrive at in your mind um, to begin? Um, and then, you know, tied to that, is there an application in your mind, um, in your role as a, as a mom right now? That's such an interesting question. Thank you, Allison. It's, yeah. Um, it's, yeah. Well, to your question about the painting process itself, I guess one of the things that, um, I, I, yeah, sometimes it felt like the only way to begin was just um, to begin with what um, sort of s sort of spoke or stood out to me, what struck me first, um, and then to respond to that. So, mm -hmm to see it as a kind of relationship of, of me as the artist to nature. And so I want to, um, yeah, um, try to respond as, as honestly as I can to, mm -hmm. to that. Um, so not, not forcing anything, mm -hmm. because I think that's what I can't, what you, what I can't do in that moment. Um, because that's the surest way then to really lose control to make something that is uh, will not have wholeness or life to it if I try to um, force it or think like um, well if I think too much about it so I think it needs to be kind of it has to be a um, receptive like response and then trying to kind of I, I mean, I even think of it as like honoring the thing I'm looking at as, mm. as, as much as I can, you know, yeah. um, in this in this representation. So in this painting. So um, I, I think though, one thing that I ended up doing sometimes was like, there are other people that would go into like, you know, forests of trees and there's all kinds of leaves and things. and for me, I just couldn't hardly, couldn't, I got, would get so overwhelmed with that, that I was like, I don't know if this is what I am meant to paint, <laughs> you know? So um, there were landscapes that seemed to sort of resonate more with me. And, um, and so that's some, that's something I loved about Venice where you had this like, you know, gorgeous sky and then the relationship of the sky to the movement of the water and these buildings in between. So like there was a kind of, um, uh, yeah, something, a simplicity to that motif. I mean, it's not simple, but like um, more than like, for me anyway, more than just like lots of trees or something. Um, so kind of like finding the motif that resonated with me most. Um, but yeah, I guess then what that has to do with, with motherhood too, or how an application, that's, a, that's such a good question. Um, I guess um, 
one of the things I've learned from painting is that kind of like, um, you know, a response to what's given, a, a responding to reality, to, to what's presented um, to your vision. And um, so then, and then, you know, as you're working with that in the painting, that it's, um, I'm seeking, I'm seeking wholeness. I'm seeking to bring this up, not force, not forcing anything, but gently. So I guess, um, I mean, I think that is making me reflect like um, with children, I think there's that too, um, an openness to seeing, seeing them for who they are and trying to like, respond to that. Like everyone, um, like I think sometimes I have, you know, I'll have expectations or too high expectations um, for for one of my kids. And, um, and yet maybe I haven't noticed the ways in which um, my child's actually been, um, is is really beautiful is doing really good and beautiful things um but maybe i'm getting you know uh, trying to um, you know, getting caught up in in all the things that they're doing wrong or the messes they're making or things like that <laughs> um but um yeah i guess it's with painting trying to have an openness to, to reality, to what's given. I want that same kind of um, openness, love towards my children. Mm. That's so beautiful and very helpful. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Thanks, Allison. Any last questions for Mary before we wrap things up? Well, Mary, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This has been so wonderful. And for also taking the time to be featured artist when you were in your ninth month of pregnancy in January, that was so wonderful. Um, you are so generous and um, gracious for agreeing to share your work and your process and everything with us and with our community. So thank you so much. Let's give Mary a big virtual round of applause. Um, thank you so and much. It, was, it was an honor. I really... Oh. Yeah, I was really thankful for this opportunity. Thank you. All. Thank you so much. And so good to see so many of you here on, on Zoom. Lovely to see so many familiar faces and some new ones too. Um, and I will circulate the recording too. So if anyone wants to share with friends um, or colleagues who couldn't make it, um, keep an eye out on your email for that recording coming soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest Thank of your you, week. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you. Wonderful, oh, beautiful. I was thinking maybe you. uh, you're welcome. After the recording, if anyone wanted to say hi to my kids, I could bring them in. <laughs> oh, lovely. Let's do it. Yes. I'll stop the recording now.